Good morning, my friends. It's good to be with you all this Sunday morning, albeit virtually. I hope you're doing well and hope you're enjoying being with your West Side family today. I wanted to reflect with you this morning about some of the ways I think about religion and perhaps some of the ways I think about faith. For some of you who've been with Westside for some time, you might not hear many things that surprise you. But I believe the people who don't know me as well might benefit from knowing where I come from in my religious orientation rather than assuming this or that. I'll do my best not to be long-winded because I know ministers can have that sort of reputation. It reminds me of this story about a ministerial colleague who put sanitary hot air hand dryers in the restrooms at the church and after two weeks took them out. When asked why, the minister confessed that the dryers worked fine, but when they went in there last week, they saw a sign that read, for a sample of this week's sermon, push the button. So I'll try not to be long-winded, but most people here know that Unitarian Universalist ministers and UUs in general are given great leeway for our beliefs. UUs are not told what to believe. There is no catechism we give to our young people about what they must believe. We don't have a creed that people must recite in order to be considered a true believer. Instead, we encourage people on their religious and spiritual quest, no matter where it leads. Our UU principles affirm this. Even while we understand our UU principles are aspirational and that we all strive to simply be kinder, more loving human beings, when the world sometimes feels like an increasingly hateful place. And I've talked before about when I was young and about to start college, I came to study religion and religions because for a variety of reasons, I no longer believed in the Christianity of my upbringing. I studied religion because I thought I might be going to hell because of my lack of faith. But that religious study at TCU, Vanderbilt, and eventually Meadville Lombard helped me come to terms with my non-theism and where I ultimately found Unitarian Universalism. Now let me just say that not all you use are non-theists. That is where my search for truth led. It may not be where yours leads. For a number of decades, UU congregations were often primarily humanist-leaning, but that's not the case these days. UU ministers and members come in a wider variety of thoughts and beliefs today, and humanists are sometimes faced with a congregation that does not sound or feel the same as it once did. But again, I believe Unitarian Universalism asks or even requires us to support one another in our search for truth, whether we agree or not. And sometimes I wonder if we might get so caught up in words, definitions, and religious labels that we undercut the broader ideals of Unitarian Universalism. Religious naturalism helps me use religious language in a way that feels authentic. Humanism makes sense in my head. Religious naturalism makes sense in my heart. Religious naturalism reminds me of the awe and wonder in the world, how just being alive is a statistical miracle, and brings to the fore what you use talk about in terms of the respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are apart. It just all fit together beautifully for me. So let me mention some names to you, some of which may be familiar, but others may not. I believe my first real exposure to a form of religious naturalism was through Michael Dowd. Some of you might remember Michael. 
Dowd was popular with UU congregations and at UU summer conferences for quite some time. And while I don't ever remember hearing him talk about religious naturalism per se, looking back, I do believe Michael was the first person who got me to delve into these ideas more deeply. Science is important, according to Dowd, but the story didn't seem big enough or beautiful enough. So he wrote a book titled, Thank God for Evolution. And one of his presentations was about how miraculous the natural world around us is. He was the first person I remember hearing say that we are all made of stardust. For those of you who don't know, Michael Dowd died October of last year, the victim of a massive heart attack at the young age of 64. P. Roger Gillette, a physicist and engineer, defined religious naturalism like this in his book titled Theology of, By, and For Religious Naturalism. Burnett wrote, Religious naturalism takes the findings of modern science seriously, and thus it is inherently naturalistic. But it also takes the human needs that lead to the emergence of religious systems seriously. Thus, it is also religious. It is religious or reconnective, he says, in that it seeks and facilitates human reconnection with oneself, family, larger human community, local and global ecosystems, and unitary universe. Religious reconnection implies love, and love implies concern, concern for the well-being of the beloved. Religious naturalism thus is marked by the concern for the well-being of the whole of nature, and this concern provides a basis and drive for ethical behavior. And one of the best known authors promoting religious naturalism is a retired professor of biology, Ursula Goodenough. Many people are introduced to the ideas of religious naturalism through her book titled, The Sacred Depths of Nature. And I'm going to mention her again in a minute but she says this about religious naturalism. She says, I profess my faith. For me, the existence of all this complexity and awareness and intent and beauty and my ability to apprehend it serves as the ultimate meaning and the ultimate value. The continuation of life reaches around grabs its own tail and forms a sacred circle that requires no further justification, no creator, no superordinate meaning of meaning, no purpose other than that the continuation continues until the sun collapses or the final meteor collides. I confess a credo, she says, of continuation, and in so doing, I confess as well a credo of human continuation. So in my opinion, religious naturalism takes humanism and makes it more beautiful, more awe-inspiring. It helps me to see and appreciate this world we live in, our involved humanity and the universe beyond. And it attempts to help me with the language of celebration that we exist at all. I also believe that moving to the Midwest has increased my desire to become more fluent in religious naturalism. When we first moved here, many of you know it was to the village of Highland Park. It's just outside of Chicago and within walking distance to the vastness of Lake Michigan. The train made it easy for us to visit the city many weekends. Unfortunately, you may have heard of Highland Park because of the mass shooting that occurred there during the 4th of July parade almost two years ago, where seven people were killed 
and 48 people wounded. But Highland Park is a lovely town. We enjoyed it a great deal. It has a sizable Jewish population. In fact, their most popular Mexican food restaurant is named Casa de Isaac and Moisha. We now reside further north in a village named Libertyville, which is located about halfway between Chicago and Milwaukee. Gail and I can walk to downtown from our home that was first built in 1870 and visit our favorite restaurants. And yet just beyond our little village, there are cornfields and open lands and horse farms and forest preserves. Old and new growth trees are abundant. Stars and constellations are easily viewed and the moon sometimes seems like I can reach out and touch it. I've seen deer in front yards and at the local cemetery. The squirrels are gray, red, and black. I've seen coyotes and foxes and chipmunks. I witnessed the flight of numerous red-tailed hawks, sandhill cranes, hundreds of Canada geese, an owl, and even bald eagles. I wrote much of this reflection on my back deck over a couple of days with lovely sunshine, temperatures in the mid-60s. This wonderful smartphone app called Merlin told me the birds I heard singing around me were sparrows and robins, finches and waxwings, warblers, and I saw the first hummingbird of the season. Before moving from Texas to the Midwest, I never really understood that spring, summer, fall, and winter were actually different seasons. Perhaps you've heard the old joke about seasons in Texas where it is said, we've got three seasons in Texas, summer, kinda summer, and three days in January where you can wear a sweater without sweating. Now, of course, there is natural beauty in Texas but perhaps growing up there, I began to take that beauty for granted somehow. Because I genuinely became more aware and awed by the world around me in the Midwest. Maybe it was merely that I was able to slow down a bit in life in general. Maybe it was merely that this was all so new to me that I paid more attention. But I began to take the time to view the world around me. Humanism in and of itself does not stir the emotional side of me, that feeling of awe and wonder. There is room for that in humanism, but it doesn't seem to receive the same amount of attention that religious naturalism gives to awe and wonder. Humanism is my peanut butter, and religious naturalism is my jelly. And the thing that holds all of this together for me, these humanistic and religious naturalist ideas, is community. None of this makes a great deal of difference to my way of thinking unless we do this together. And that, for me, is the appeal of Unitarian Universalism. Like I said, it's not that you have to be a humanist like me. And you don't have to have anything to do with religious naturalism if you don't want to. But as I said earlier, Unitarian Universalism calls for you to support me in my search for truth and that I support your search as well. And the way we do that best is by being with one another in community. None of this really matters to me if I think and read about these things in a silo by myself. So for those of you who might be interested in learning more, I do think there is no better place to start than Ursula Goodenough's Sacred Depths of Nature. You'll be very glad you did. I'd also encourage you to check out Chet Ramos' book titled, When God is Gone, Everything is Holy the making of a religious naturalist. 
Isn't that a splendid title? When God is gone, everything is holy. I find Ramo's story to be very interesting. He was a zealous Roman Catholic when attending the University of Notre Dame in, I believe, the 1950s. A young man from rural Tennessee, he loved the rigors of the Catholic faith. Indeed, he wanted to be more rigorous. He also loved the rigors of science. And his studies in physics began to get in the way of his faith. And by the time he began his collegiate teaching career in physics, that faith he had as a younger person had all but slipped away. At the same time, as a physicist, he understood how expansive the world around him and beyond to be, and he looked for new language to capture his beliefs. Ramo, in my opinion, writes beautifully and the story of how religious naturalism gave him a new way of thinking and different language to express it is an inspiring read. So in addition to Goodenough's Sacred Depths of Nature and Ramo's When God is Gone, Everything is Holy, I'd, let, I'd like to let you know about the website for the Religious Naturalist Association. The address on the web are those three words with a couple of hyphens. So it's religious-naturalist-association.org. Or simply use your favorite search engine for Religious Naturalist Association. Once at the website, you can contact them to inquire about a special di discussion list for Unitarian Universalists interested in religious naturalism. And one of the most active people on the RNUU discussion list is Ursula Goodenough herself. She considers herself a Unitarian Universalist and is often in UU pulpits telling others about this way of looking at the world. So those books, those circumstances are what helped me find religious naturalism. It is how I think of the world in a bigger way with awe and wonder, acknowledging the human impulse to gather in religious community. Now I'd love to hear your story too sometime. I hope you'll remember that even though I'm about a thousand miles away from Fort Worth, I'm available to talk about what's important to you. It's as easy as sending an email to minister at westsideuu.org and I'll send you a link to my calendar where we can set up a time to talk. Enjoy the world around you this summer as much as you can. Seek out and find those instances of awe and wonder. Be in community as often as you dare and treat this world and one another as if we were all sacred. As we rise together in body or spirit and join in singing our closing hymn number 21 for the beauty of the earth.